So where are you now? Are you back? Are you in Scotland or London or where are you? Uh, I'm in London right now. Um, I was meant to be in Wales uh, filming this week, but we've had another little uh, stop, like, not a complete stoppage, but a couple of the scenes have been affected because someone was exposed to somebody with COVID, so they've now got to self-isolate. <laughs> so, yeah, and it's been getting, it's just been getting steadily uh, kind of trickier the last couple of weeks, actually. No, no one actually getting COVID, but yeah having to isolate because of it so yeah i understand i mean i'm in wales myself so and uh, every day is a challenge you know we get we get the politicians say one thing and then next day be something completely different and it's beyond yeah no it, it really is it really is in the ice i guess you know what what can they do but the isolation period is a bit of a um it's definitely a bit of a problem yeah, yeah. Uh, right now, because um, we've had several actors having to isolate a couple of times, and both times they didn't actually have to isolate, but mm. you know you've got to follow the guidelines. So, because yeah. this is season two, isn't it? You're still filming, or is, that, is it? This is season three. Oh, season three, right? Okay, so okay. Season two comes out in um, uh, on January the eighth. Right. Okay. Um, I was just thinking that. I was thinking if they're still filming parts of season two, I'm thinking they better pull the figure out. So. No, 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 no. This is this is season three. It's quite. I mean, it's quite odd filming season three before season two has come out because normally, you know, you've had a reaction to the season that you've just done before you go off and do uh, the other one. So, I mean, I, that's maybe a good thing. I, I don't know. It depends if you know if uh, if the series is released on January the eighth. Uh, and it didn't go down well, then we've only got a few weeks left of filming, but um, I don't think that'll happen, actually. I think season two is... I, I, I'm thinking it's going to go down pretty well. Right, OK, yeah. I, I, it's it's a great series, man. I mean, the first season anyway, but... Um, no, but your character then, you're obviously portraying Galaglass, which is obviously a fan favourite. Yeah. Um, a, t- a typical question is, I mean, how have you approached the role? I mean, how did you sort of read the book back-to-back and, you know, and was it just yeah. a script? Yeah, I read the book. So when I got the part, I had, uh, when I auditioned, I Googled, you know, to find out a little bit about Galaglass uh, and quickly discovered that he was a fan favourite um, in the in the book series. And and also, um, you know, he's described in the books and on online as well, very much as being, you know, a really big guy and, uh, and, and very muscular and this sort of almost gentle giant type uh, at times. Um, I'm five, uh, five ten, so I'm not exactly uh, a giant. So from a physical point of view, um, I wasn't, uh, I was a little bit um, unsure whether or not I fitted the bill uh, in that sense. Um, but uh, when I read the books, I could actually see uh, and I kind of understood a bit more why they why they cast me because I think personality wise and stuff I bring probably a lot of traits uh, to Galaglass. So I then after I got cast, I grew this beard, uh, which I feel like I've had uh, forever uh, now, <laughs> and uh, and I basically started spending a lot of time uh, in the gym, and uh, uh, and not eating the usual amounts of ice cream and chocolate that I uh, that I normally do. Yeah, because I've, I've seen some of your posts about the the gym posts. You sort of take the um take the piss about the the, the gym gym wank or whatever post yeah. just for fun. I know you do it for fun, but you know, and you and you look you're looking quite gym man, honestly. Oh, thank you. I mean, I kind of I do. There's a there's a lot there's a large side of myself that hates me for for posting that. I don't really. It's not my. Uh, I don't think it's necessarily who I am or kind of what I normally like doing, but it's part of you know it's slightly just kind of just kind of showing uh, the work in a way because you never know what's going to make it actually onto screen so there was part of me that wanted to be like look I have done it you know I've, I've done my side of it and also I know that um you know from having been an outlander um I know that there's a you know um, the book fans have got really high expectations and my, obviously the, the character Galaglass there's a lot higher expectations um of, of him and so uh, I kind of, I want to do that as good as them, as good a service as I can. By the same token, you're never going to please all the people all the time. And when you get into that, you know, you're, all, you're always going to be too small or too big or too this or too that or whatever. So there's no point in 
uh, you know, winding yourself up too much about it. When you mentioned Outlander, I mean, obviously, it's, I'm not saying obviously Discovery Witches and Outlander are similar, they, but they're very, how, how they're made. I mean, the, yeah. the huge, you know, productions, but you yeah. can sort of see some sort of, you know, you've gone from one to the other. And I mean, does that appeal to you, that sort of productions? There's definitely, you know what, I think there is a, there's a, there's a similarity there in a sense. And uh, I think they appeal to a very similar fan base uh, for a start. And I've since discovered that from my Twitter um, a lot of the Outlander fans were big Discovery of Witches fans. And in fact, when the audition came in and I Googled, one of the reviews I read of season one said, a Discovery of Witches sits somewhere between Outlander and somewhere between Twilight. I don't know. I don't know how accurate that is, but I, you know, I understand the need to try and uh, c- categorise or, you know, put something in a box. Um, I think um, I was a bit, you know, I was a, li- I was a, t- I was a little bit, I mean, I don't know if apprehensive apprehensive is the word, but before I auditioned for it, I did wonder if I wanted to get back in uh, to that sort of uh, world um, uh, again. Um, I mean, like Outland has been amazing, and the fan base is absolutely uh, incredible. But then, you know, the more I read about Galaglass, and then when I wa- I hadn't seen season one at that point, but I watched season one. I absolutely loved it. And I didn't realise how good the cast was as well. You know, like from Matthew Good to Teresa Palmer, uh, to Lindsay Duncan, to Owen Teal, to Tri- you know, there's yeah. just a host of great actors in it. And uh, and yeah, I mean, that stuff does appeal to me as well. As a kid, I always loved fantasy. I, you know, I've always loved sci-fi. And it really struck me last week. Now, as we're getting kind of towards the end of season three, and I've been auditioning for some other stuff. I auditioned last week to play a lawyer in this great new in this great new drama. But when I was going over the lines for that, it's present day, it's courtroom, and I thought, yeah, you know what? I'll probably miss playing a, an eight hundred year old vampire. <laughs> like, it kind of well, lawyers, lawyers are vampires. That's what some people say anyway. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> it offers a lot of scope to quite fantastical situations. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but now you, you, they've been filming a lot of the, the series right near me because I live not far, I don't want to say on here, but I, I live not too far from where you've been filming a lot of Discovery, which is season three. So, um, and I drive around, I see the signs saying where they're filming, you know, the, the little pointers. Yeah. So I see quite yeah, a few yeah. of them. So, Lock. yeah, yeah, yeah. Are hmm? Whereabouts are you? Um, it's, it's a place called Marcross in you know, Nash Point. Oh, okay, right. I, got, I think you filmed at Atlantic College for some of it. Um, yes, actually, I think we did. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you, well, you did. I know you did, for definite, yeah. yeah. No, 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 I think that's, I remember filming. I think I was in that scene, actually. Yeah, that's about half a mile from my house, so. Okay. Yeah, so it's not too far, so it, um, but no, with, um, you, you mentioned, obviously, you, you know, audition for, like, that, a lawyer thing, and obviously, and we just joked about, obviously, vamp, you know, they could be very vampire Um <laughs> Do, do you think you will, I mean, you've, you've, you've been very, very, you've done so many things over the last 19 years, I think it is, since you yeah. left university or, or, or college, sorry. Yeah. Um, you, you've never stopped working. I mean, you've done stage, you know, you've done a lot of TV, you've done a lot of film. Do, do you, do, which, are you happy or are you content with whatever comes your way? Or do you have a sort of a passion which you'd rather, you know, stick to, say, theatre or... No, I mean, I don't really, the first, I mean, the first few years, I, I don't know, it maybe looks like that on my CV, but the first few years, first six or seven years, I hardly worked at all. I was mostly uh, restaurants, cafes, you know, uh, offices, that sort of stuff. But that's, that's par for the course for most actors, yeah. really, I think, unless you're very lucky. Uh, and it wasn't until kind of my late 20s, early 30s, I started getting some consistent work. My first, my first passion above all, all else and it still is is musical theater actually um okay. that's what got me into acting and i've done a couple of musicals uh you know uh, when i was a bit younger um and i would i would love to go back and do a musical again actually uh, at some point i don't really know if my boys could hold up to it now it's been a i did a singing gig for charity uh two weeks ago for the first time and i was absolutely shitting myself <laughs> I mean, it's funny, it's, you know, I've, I've done it before, but it's been such a long time. There's something about standing on stage singing mm. is more exposing, I think, uh, than anything. And I actually, for the first time ever, I actually forgot my lines during one of the songs. 
and I had to try and fit in lines from earlier on in the song yeah. into the second verse. No one noticed, but you know, I was having a, a bit of a heart attack. Um, but you know, as it goes now, I think the last years I've really, really enjoyed um, you know the film and TV work uh, that I've done, and so like a hundred percent, I would I would go back and work in the theatre. I think actually, especially now in light of obviously obviously um, how bad this year has been uh, for the theatre industry, um, it's kind of I think it's certainly made me and made everyone in the industry and maybe outside the industry as well realise how important live performance is, not just yeah. theatre. You know, just live performance. Um, yeah. it's, it's been it's hard. I mean, it's it's you know it, it's sad, so saddening for the you know for live theatre and you know and even for live music as well. It's just it's totally. Just you know, I and mean, you must have so many friends that are you know out of work. You know, oh, I mean, listen, it, it actually, it really hit home two or three weeks ago. I was um, on Twitter. Somebody posted something that was a link from. Um, uh, the ITN News and an actress that I worked with nine years ago when I did Company, a musical up in Sheffield, uh, an actress called AJ, AJ Cassidy, I think. Um, is it AJ Cassidy? Uh, she's um, quite a big, you know, uh, name in musical theatre. Uh, and she'd done a little interview with ITV News because her and her husband haven't worked all this year, and they're both delivering parcels for Hermes, um, a pound a parcel, yeah. um, you know, and if it doesn't get delivered, they don't, they don't get any money. And um, that also on top of my wife, actually the casting director for um, Ken Loach, and I don't know if you saw Sorry We Missed You. Yeah, 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 I did. I did. You know, yeah. and it just, you know, it, it kind of really brings home that idea. And as she pointed out, she was like, you know, <laughs> two kids, and you know, a month or two out of work, and everyone's, you know, well, most people are struggling. Yeah, no, it is. It's um, it, it's even for me. I mean, I can talk about you know, quick one on me. I had to, I went from doing a lot of writing gigs, being in the Maldives, Qatar, come back, and then nothing. And then I had to, um, no mags weren't going to print, so I, I worked for Asda delivering food. Wow, I did that for a few, few months. I still do like one a day a week just to because I give something back, but now I'm obviously this is all back up and we're working again. It's done, it's done me a favour this year in, in a weird way. It's got me to where I am now, very, very fortunate, but I, I kept at it, you know? Um, yeah. And positive, but yeah, for a few months, I was doing Asda, getting up at like six in the morning, delivering food around the Welsh Valleys, which you probably know. <laughs> and it's, God. Yeah, man, it's been an interesting year, but it makes you realise, you know, and it makes you reset a lot of things, you know, and what you need, what you oh, don't need. A hundred, a hundred percent. Um, I, uh, I've noticed that actually sometimes with some of the delivery drivers, and I was saying that to my wife, when we get food or whatever delivered, you, you notice the demographic, the age range, everything has changed in the last few months because exactly that. And I'm just, I'm so that we'd moved house just before the pandemic, and uh, like you know, really, really stretched ourselves to the utter limit. Yeah. to do it and we worked out you know my wife's self-employed as well we worked out worst case scenarios and nobody's worst case scenario was a, a worldwide pandemic that would shut down your industry you know uh unless in january some people were really prescient and saw what was going on mm. in china but um so i was i'm just i'm really 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 lucky that i had uh, discovery of witches uh coming back up i mean i'm always because i spent so much of my early career unemployed i'm always grateful but um, uh, particularly so this time, I've been very lucky. And so you say you've, you've obviously seen it. I mean, I did glance at your CV and it, it seems like you've been working every year, but I know you can, they obviously you can make the CV look amazing. But I, yeah. I know I, I knew you'd obviously have to get a little part-time jobs or full-time jobs just to be an actor, you know, like we, we all do with writers or whatever. Um, but you've obviously worked hard to get where you are. You know, you've never given up. And the motivation, I mean, that's, is that you've always wanted to be an actor from, from young or...? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, as long as I can remember, like, really wanting to do it. I always, like, when I was at primary school, uh, I quite liked doing the, the school musicals. And then when I went to secondary school, I got really into singing and doing the school musicals. And it was always something that I flirted with the idea of. But 15 years old, 14 years old, you know, growing up where I, I lived in Scotland, we had, and not that I really, I'm not into the... Uh, I don't really care about the working class thing and all, but, you know, I grew up in a very poor council estate. We didn't have any money, um, you know, or much money. 
Yeah. Uh, so the idea of going to one of these drama schools and stuff, I just, I didn't know how you did it. I didn't know anyone that was an actor. So you just don't really, um, you know, I had no idea how the industry worked. And so I kind of, I, I you know, you kind of stumble into it almost. I went to drama school, yeah. came out of drama school and thought, well, I guess you moved to London now and you just become like a big star or something. It must be quite easy. <laughs> moved to London, queue. Uh, you know, six or seven years of uh, of mostly unemployment. Yeah. So oh, this is uh, this is frozen. Are you still there? Still oh, there, there we go. There. No, no, just, uh, the screen just paused for a minute. And uh, yeah, you know, so the first six or seven years out of drama school were a real rude awakening. Um, but I think I'll, I'll just move my computer. I actually, say my internet connection is unstable. That's fine. I'll go through to my bedroom. Normally, it's my um, internet connection, mate. So the, I, I uh, out of the middle of nowhere. Well, mind you, like, I've got bloody sky fiber, whatever, and it's always saying how good it is, but it's it, it, it's only ever at times like this where it's suddenly a shite. Yeah. Uh, um, but I think, you know, yeah, I definitely had, I remember when I was about 26 or 27, mm. and it had been, you know, a struggle. And my dad said to me at one point, you know, why don't you, would you ever consider, you know, going and retraining and becoming a teacher or something? And I was like, look, I've got nothing against that, but I just, I, I don't want to give up on this until I've given it absolutely sort of everything. And, you know, in very dramatic, actory terms, I was almost like, I'd rather, you know, yeah. I, I'd rather I'd rather die penniless and, you know, like, but at least having really, really, really followed, yeah. followed my dream. Because I guess you start to question, you know, what, what is life about? What am I what I want to do. And at that point in my life, um, pursuing, not to sound cheesy, but pursuing my dream was more important than having a steady wage or, you know, having material possessions uh, or whatever. And fortunately, uh, I got, I, I think it's, a, an, you know, I think it's part persistence, part luck and yeah. part talent or something. And, um, you know, but what was it? What yeah, sort of role that made you realise that you know this this was the real deal? You you were making it. You know you sort of. And you can tell your dad, and your dad is like, okay, you don't need to become a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think actually, when I was twenty seven years old, uh, I got a part. Uh, I got one of the lead parts in a West End musical called Cabaret, and that was, uh, you know, it had been my that had literally been my dream as a kid to play a lead in a West End musical. And I, I was working in a restaurant at the time called Carluccio's, which I think they've now gone under as well, haven't they? Yeah, they have, man. yeah, yeah. Um, I was working in Carluccio's and I remember I was waiting to get the phone call on the Saturday morning to hear if I got the part. Uh, and if I didn't get the part, I was going to be going back into Carluccio's the next day. Yeah. Um, but got the phone call, got the part. And that... You know, I still had, I still had, after I finished that job, I still had times of unemployment and I still have had and continue to have struggles and get knocked back for, for a lot of additions. But that was the one, and I don't know if you've had a similar thing in your profession as well. That was the one where I thought, all right, I can do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not, because you start to go through, when you're younger, you're kind of, I was certainly delusional and I also just didn't understand what acting was or what the career was. Mm. And so you start to think, was I just kidding myself on, you know? Yeah. Maybe I was, maybe I was good at school, but the reality is I'm not good enough in the real world. Um, so that was a real, um, you know, kind of change things in my head, I think. And, and did you pinch yourself? For me, I, I, when I've been in some situation, like, like you say about, you know, where I know that I've done really well and I still pinch myself. I literally do pinch myself because I'm thinking I'm in this meeting, I'm doing this, or I'm in, I'm in this sort of nice hotel, or I'm doing this. I pinch myself thinking, is how has this happened? But I know it's not hard work. I, I honestly that when I can I still actually fun enough, even when I was talking about it there, it still makes me a little bit emotional because when I got that job, you know, and I, I called my mum in the morning to let her know, and I'd been going, you know, I'd, I'd you know, it's actually it's it, it's well documented uh, now for us, but I don't think people really even 15 years were speaking about it. But I was definitely having some. Uh, you know, and I, I never went to a doctor or anything like that, but I was definitely having anxiety issues, you know, uh, mental health brought, and just, you know, whether or not it would have ever been termed as depression, it was a tough, tough time. 
And so, you know, for your mum to see you going through that as well, I think I remember when I called her up, she burst into tears on the phone and then I started crying. And I remember the first day of rehearsals, um, Julian Cleary was in it. Yeah. And I grew up watching Julian on TV as sticky moments. I used to watch him on a Friday night. Uh, Amy Nuttall was playing Sally Bowles. And again, Amy was somebody who I'd always known as a TV star. And it was just really like, fuck, how did I... I was I was serving customers on Friday, yeah, and I'm now in this West End yeah. uh, musical. It was really, and I try. Do you know? I still try. And, I have to try and remind myself of that sometimes. When you get, you know, not to take anything for granted, or sometimes when you're on set and you're not having a good day and you can get a little bit money or something. It's good to just take a step back and look about you and be like, "Wow, yeah. I'm doing what I wanted to do." Exactly. You know, you can just look around you and just think, well, you know, where, where would you want to be? And, you know, it's like where you have been, but now where you are, you know, and, and, it, and it's, it's obviously a tough journey for, for all actors or writers or whatever, whatever possess, profession you do. It's tough. Totally. The whole, you know, life is tough, but you've got to make, you know, you make, um, yeah, I think you make your own sort of, you can make, not make your own path to where you want to be, but you can sort of help, you know, and... I think, yeah. I think so, definitely. I, I, I definitely. I think that's what I realised when I got to about 26 or 27. I also wasn't really helping myself. It was easy to blame everything else and be like, oh, it's their fault, it's, it's him. Yeah. My agent's not good enough. You know, this isn't good enough. And then, you know, I had to kind of take a look at myself and be like, right, well, am I applying myself the best I could? Am I being the most professional? Uh, you know, am I preparing as well as I could? And the answer to a lot of those questions was no. Um, and I think once I started taking some personal responsibility, I started getting luckier. <laughs> yeah, you know, well, it's down to your skill, man. You know, what I mean, it's 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 mm. you know, you you are obviously a very good actor because you you know you've you've been in some great productions. Um, so you it's, you know, it's tantamount for you know for yourself, you know, you are wanted. You know, you're getting good work and you are give, giving good work. Yeah, yeah. I thought, well, yeah. I mean, again, I think that like, I think I've got. Uh, I, I, I feel personally that I've got better as I've, as I've got older um, as well. And again, maybe that's the same in, in all jobs, but I, as much as when I was a kid or when I was at drama school, I was um, quite fixated on the idea of if I wanted to come out and just, you know, be like Ewan McGregor or something, or just because I, I, didn't, I didn't know what the level below that was or what a jobbing actor was. I just yeah. saw movies. Uh, and actually those years of late unemployment as well my confidence completely went i i like in acting to a lot of um sports actually like football and stuff you know when the goals dry up your confidence goes you know you yeah. can be playing for a Vauxhall conference team but actually be capable of playing in the premiership but you're just not getting you know the exposure or da -da 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 -da. and uh my confidence completely and utterly went and it took me you know, I think from job to job to job to job. And then uh, in my 30s, I've had better parts uh, yeah. as well. And my confidence has grown with that. Um, so and your anxiety is OK then, you know, you're, you're coping with that. You're coping with all the anxiety and things like that. It's all your. Yeah, I think, you know, I think like, a, you know, a hundred times better yeah. uh, the, the, than I ever was. Anxiety is a really funny thing because, you, you know, I've never thought of myself as an anxious person. Uh, per se but then sometimes I think you know um, I've been involved in it you know I've, I've been helping out every now and again with a charity in Scotland called the Chris Boyd uh, mental health uh, charity and I've always been like you know I've done uh, for lack of a better expression you know a lot of work on myself in the past and I've always been interested in um, you know uh, certain self-help books or uh, I've gone to therapy in the past to try and you know, help uh, myself break through mental barriers. Mental barriers like actually c convincing yourself, convincing yourself that you can't be successful, like whatever success means. And I don't mean just in work terms. I mean, just whatever success is for you. And I think, uh, well, per I, 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 I'm certainly my own worst enemy. And I think most people, uh, you know, yeah. most people are. Uh, and I wouldn't change any of that now because in a way I'd love to know what I know now as a 26 year old, but by the same token, 
yeah, yeah. It clearly, that clearly wasn't my path. And if you look at it, you know, the great saying that it's about the it's about the destination, not the journey. Then actually, I wouldn't have learned everything I've, I've learned, and I don't now. You know, I look back on those times working in restaurants and stuff, and you know, it kind of made me who I am. Yeah. Um, yeah. So and I wouldn't you know, forget any of that. And you, and you don't forget them times. You know, you don't forget where you've been and what you've come from. And you know, I mean, there are some actors out there that do sort of, you know, live the dream, but then they portray a certain image and it's not a good one you know but I I, I like guys like yourself and, and ladies like that have had to work out you know go to college or university or whatever and, and drama in, in school and but had part-time jobs and full-time jobs and then being without employment between jobs it yeah. makes them a stronger person and I think people warm to a lot of people do warm to you as actors you know from the fan base because the, the, you're real people do you know yeah 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 no I think so I think so and I, I also look, but you know, I, I look back on those times, you know, with with real fondness uh, as well. And I met, uh, especially working in restaurants in London as well, I met like a really fascinating cross spectrum of people, which coming from a town like Kilmarnock, where the demographic was pretty much, you know, the same. Yeah, yeah, it's like more, it. <laughs> yeah, totally. you know, I was suddenly exposed to so many different cultures you know so many different people so many different languages and, and that was actually one of the things when I moved to London I, I loved that straight away I loved it when I sat on the tube within a within a two meter vicinity you could hear like about 10 different languages yeah and yeah. that you know that side of it always really appealed to me yes it's when I first went to London the same you know you sit on the tube and you, and you just you see all these landmarks you see on the tv and then you you hear the accents you see the people and, you, and, you, and it's like a different world isn't it like you're a rabbit in the head with headlights Oh, you, know, totally. headlights, you know, but and that goes on for weeks, not just hours, that goes on for weeks when you live there. Oh. That... <laughs> Absolutely. That was another thing as well. It took me a few years to really adjust to living in London as well. Okay. Okay. I think, you know, going from a town like, you know, come on, it's just quite a small town, but, uh, it, you know, it took me uh, definitely the first three or four or five years to kind of get to grips uh, with, with London. I think it's quite um, special. I think, that's you know what maybe that's the same if you move to any big city or anywhere unfamiliar when things aren't going your way as well i think it makes it even harder yeah yeah do you think you'll ever end up going back home i mean obviously i know the works obviously you're london or america or whatever you know when there's a good base spot do you ever think yeah. you might to go back to even just to scotland per se well we're talking you know we, we my wife is, is from glasgow and so and she's only lived in london for six years whereas i've been here for for 19 years um excuse me so basically i've been here my whole adult life and even though i'm very close to my family still in scotland uh and i've still got some great friends up there my my adult life has been built down here uh whereas my wife spent most of her adult life uh, in glasgow so yeah. she's got i think she's got a slightly stronger pull to it than me but funnily enough her career now, as an actor, I can kind of live anywhere, but her career is very much um, kind of London-centric. Yeah. Uh, now, obviously, COVID has slightly thrown everything up in the air right now, but yeah. working on the assumption that the vaccine will work and we will get back to, yeah. I mean, hopefully get back to normal. I'd rather get back to normal than the new normal. Uh, so. <laughs> yeah, I know. But I have a uh, saying, though, I think my wife, you know, I think the women always choose or decide or get to win where we get to live. So <laughs> your wife's probably the same. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I have certainly I have learned in the in the years that we've been together that when it comes to making decisions, she's actually genuinely just better at making decisions than me as well. I'm not, <laughs> yeah, I'm not a fantastic decision maker, so I will more often than not just be like, yeah, you know what? Uh, we still moan though. We still moan about it. I know, a hundred, a hundred percent, and I'm still moan about the decision after it's been made. <laughs> well, then eventually say that was your decision, and then you argue about that. So no, I made the decision. No, you didn't. I did, and like, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. You know what? Long term, though, I think I do. I definitely. I love Scotland and uh, and I love Glasgow and I love Kilmarnock. Um, I mean, there's absolutely not a chance that we will ever move back to Kilmarnock because my my wife wouldn't want that. You know, it would be Glasgow. Yeah. Um, but um, maybe in a few years. But then we've got a young daughter now as well, 
yeah. who who know you know when she move, when she grows up she probably won't want to move but we'll see yeah i understand i've got a daughter as well so i, I know where right. she's, she's... that starts to <laughs> make a lot of you know schools etc and different a different world isn't it it's just like oh right you, you get into that and you, it's great i enjoy it but if you if I went back twenty years and think what thought where I'd be now and then I'd just be kicking myself, I'd want to kick myself up the backside, not kicking myself, thinking oh pinching, my, you know, thinking Jesus, what have I become? <laughs> Friday, Saturday nights, do nothing. <laughs> oh no, no, this is the thing with it. when lockdown started, and you know, and certainly in terms of like social life at night time, mm. we, were, we were we were both like well, you know, our daughter was. Uh, it just turned two at the okay. beginning of lockdown. So our social life for the last three years hasn't been that spectacular uh, anyway. Uh, and we don't have any family in London, so it's not always easy getting a babysitter either. Yeah, yeah. So obviously, you know, lockdown was a little bit different, but there was a lot of it that wasn't hugely different for us in terms of not being able to go out, mm. you know, and just... That's, yeah. um, you know, having a young child changes all that anyway. Yeah, <laughs> it's got its plus points, COVID, doesn't it? You know, people yeah. stuck at home with the kids or whatever, yes. Totally. Um, so what was I going to say? Um, so what else have you got lined up? I know you said you auditioned for an, um, a lawyer. Have you got anything that's set in place or any, anything firmed up? After uh, Discovery? I, don't know, I don't have anything set in place to do straight after Discovery of Witches, but I've got a film coming out as well called uh, Martyr's Lane that I filmed. <laughs> I get a film that in uh, October, uh, October 2019. Um, actually, right in the middle of, I had a month off from a Discovery of Witches, uh, and I was able to go and, and do this film, which was great as well because it was so you know because in Discovery of Witches I'm playing this, uh, you know, qu uh, quite not quite large on life, but quite a large kind of Scottish warrior. Uh, character uh, and in, a, in the film I played um, a minister uh, an English minister who's quite just like a kind of you know good nice upstanding oh, posh speaking uh, and, yeah. uh, decent guy yeah. and it was quite a different part from uh, it was quite a different part from uh, uh, from Gallaglass it was good fun getting to do that at the same time and I think it was a really beautiful script um, as well I mean it's ostensibly a horror story kind of ghost story but horror um essentially and um about uh loss okay. uh and the it's got denise goff is in it as well who's been doing really well the last few yeah. years she, she did a play a few years ago that exploded um but uh the stars in it really are, are a couple of young girls uh, who were absolutely fantastic uh, in it so i'm i'm interested is that out soon or is that out in digital? Well, it was going to be out this year, but because of uh, because of COVID, um, I think they've been. It's one of those films that hopefully will get into some festivals uh, and yeah. do the festival circuit. So, but it was a little bit. We had to go and do a reshoot. Mm. We can do a reshoot until September uh, yeah. or something. Um, and um, I mean, my, my actually, do you know what? One of my uh, one of my best vanity moments on that was because I was in the middle of doing Discovery of Witches and I'd been hitting it hard at the gym. When I came in for costume, uh, the costume lady said, you're actually far too muscular for all the costumes. Which I was like, well, you know what? I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I wish I was like that. I mean, I've, I've got to get myself in shape. I'm not fat at all. You know, I'm, I'm quite trim. I'm 5'10", five, 5'11", five, yeah. probably the same height as you. Yeah. But... You know, I'm but I'm older than you. I'm 47, so. Um, so. Uh, listen, there's there's no motivation like uh, knowing that you're going to have to get your top off on camera, but also like that the character has been consistently described as like some sort of muscular beast. Yeah. So yeah. it's like you know, which I'm I'm never going to get to that level. It's only so big uh, I can get. But the pre, I've I've kind of. Um, well, I put the pressure on myself, but you just, it, it's yeah. a good motivation. So Otherwise, is it, I, I would have done it. Is it a bit like, are you going to be, you know, you're going to start us by being like James McAvoy was in Glass, that sort of, you know, pumped or? Yeah, exactly. That's, you know, that's, uh, um, you know, I, I know that, you know, I know that James works really, really hard 
uh, mm. you know, really hard for that. And, yeah. uh, and in fact, actually, I asked him for a couple of uh, pointers when I was getting, uh, getting in shape for this, kind of what he did um, for that. So it's, uh, yeah, actually, because funnily enough, I think when he was doing that, when he was getting in training for that, for the first one, he was still doing X-Men. Right. So, you know, his, his Xavier clothing probably got a little bit tighter. <laughs> Yeah, I'll ask him one day when I spend a speak to him. Oh, there, yeah, it must have been quite tricky for him actually thinking about it. Um, yeah. But you've you've tell me about yourself. Then you back. You've you've done quite a few things with Noel Clark over the years, haven't you? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Do you, would you? Is that something you want to go back to? Because he's he's obviously a very talented as a director and a writer, and obviously an actor yeah. and everything else he does. Yeah, hundred percent. Noel's actually Noel's been there. Uh, Noel's been one of the um, uh, consistent uh, people in the business in my career who's always got in touch uh, and offered me work or, um, or or got me in for stuff like, and it's funny, like when I did 4321, I did a tiny part in 4321, but I got an American representation out of that. And so I went off to LA for a little while and um, spent quite a lot of time in LA. And even though nothing ultimately uh, came of it, that was a brilliant experience. And I loved all the time uh, that I spent there as well. That was a real sort of, I don't I, now looking back, I don't really care that I didn't get any work there, but from a life experience point of view, um, I loved it. Uh, you know, and I've done what else have I done with them? Legacy, um, uh, a bit in Brotherhood. But the best thing that he yeah. ever, uh, the best thing that Noel ever kind of collaborated or, or helped me on, I, I made a short film two or three years ago. And I was trying to, I had written the script. And for about a year, I was talking about trying to get it made. But short films, you probably know, but short films are actually quite difficult to get made because nobody funds them, really. So you have to kind of finance it yourself. Crowdfund, crowdfund or whatever. So is it crowdfunding or something like that you use or you can do? Yeah, you can do like or Kickstarter or, you know, those sort of things. And um, uh, I happened to, Noel was asking me what I was up to and I was just chatting about this and chatting about that. And I mentioned this short film script and he said, send it over. He read it. I mean, I don't know. He called me back an hour or two hours later and he said, all right, let's make it. Mm. And I was like, what? And he's like, yeah, let's do it. Jason uh, and his producing partner, Jason, he said, Jason loves it as well. So uh, have you got a director in mind? And I did have a director in mind at that point. He said, right, well, let's do it. And then Jason, who is his producing partner, actually, Jason Mazza, he ended up directing it. And uh, we did a Kickstarter campaign. Um, we raised thanks. I mean, really thanks to Outlander fans. We raised thirteen thousand pounds in like eight hours or something. Crazy. Yeah, it blew me away. I mean, it was honestly crazy. I didn't know what the response was going to be, and I remember putting it on Twitter, and it just they just responded so enthusiastically. Um, and uh, that actually, I it was such an amazing uh, process making your you know creating your own work and actually yeah. even though it was just a short film, but uh, I absolutely loved it and uh, it ended up that film, I, which is how I got involved with the Chris Boyd mental health charity. They saw it and, you know, part part of the theme of the film is a man who's kind of, you know, um, basically at the, the very end of his tether. Um, and so they used it on their website uh, for a bit as a kind of tool. Oh, good. That's great. That's great. Yeah, which was great because that was never the intention when, when we made it. So it was great that I had this life uh, outside of that. But that typifies Noel. I mean, that is Noel is an absolute and utter doer. Like, I talk about things and two or three years later, I'll still be talking about it. Yeah. Noel talks about something and then two minutes later, it's done. <laughs> <laughs> so he's right now, Noel. Not, no, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's like... You know, and he's got three kids as well, and he's his his ability to, um, he's a bit of a polymath actually, uh, I think. Um, and I think actually, I don't know, I've said before, but I think he would get, you know, somebody like Kenneth Branagh, who I've worked with as well. Hmm. Branagh gets a lot of respect in the industry and a lot of kudos, and I don't know if that's because it's always been Shakespeare uh, type stuff, but I don't think Noel gets the respect and the kudos uh, that he deserves for everything that he's done. Uh, the employment that he's created, the amount of actors that started off in his films and went on to bigger careers as well. Yeah, massive, yeah, I know. You know, so... 
He is. He's, he's um, the stuff he's done. I mean, you, you know, I've been following him for years, and I think he's 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 great. You know, he really is. And, and like you say, you've you worked with him quite a few times, and he obviously can recognise your talent. You know, but what 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 I mean? What why did you hit it off with him? You know, was it something about you just jump on set, or did you sort of know him before when you did your first? We did a we both. Um, he did a film. We, we did a film called Huge. Um, ben Miller. Okay. Ben Miller. Uh, wrote and directed and Ben has been a friend of mine for uh, for about 16 or 17 years and Ben's actually been somebody who when I wasn't when I wasn't getting much work and when I was trying to kind of find my way in the industry Ben was somebody who was like, completely uh, instrumental uh, and encouraging and and, um, and helpful uh, to me and in fact actually I probably wouldn't I, I, I think it's fair to say I might not have the career that I ended up having if Ben hadn't been so supportive at that time which again i think is something that uh you know in any career you you need a bit of help one way or the other you yeah, know you need yeah. some support or something and um yeah so i had a little bit in this film huge uh with noel and i was doing a scene with noel and noel just out the blue one day said uh i've got a bit for you in my next film i think and i was like all right cool and he said yeah i'll give your agent a call and noel also is like now that I know no better, I mean, you know no one-on-one, Noel is such a nice guy, and he's, like, really gentle. He's a real family man, and he's a big softy. You see a totally different side from his, like, public persona, I think. Uh, and when he said this to me, I was like, yeah, all right, okay. You know, because you hear people in the industry saying that sometimes. Uh, and lo and behold, a few weeks later, my agent called and said, oh, you've been offered this part uh, in, uh, in 4321. Mm. Uh, it was like five or six lines, one scene. But at that point in my career, that was a you know it's a big deal. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and also, he kept his word, which is, yeah. uh, you know, uh, which is That's worth more than anything, isn't it? And especially, yeah. in the industry, especially in the industry. And, uh, and we just kind of, you know, we always kept in touch, and he would get me back in for stuff, uh, and then you know, stayed friends. You know, you know, when you went to LA then and you'd like try to get representation out there. I mean, I've never really asked an actor this one, but I sort of have an idea what it's like when you go out there. You sort of take me to all these shows, do events and just get your face around and all the rest. Yeah. How did you cope with all that? Because it's, were you just like thinking, you know, well, did, well, you obviously enjoyed it. You must have enjoyed it. But a part of you must have thought it's just surreal. You know, it's a surreal sort of environment, LA. Oh. <laughs> I know, but a few times and it's just surreal. Totally surreal. You know, I think the first time when I went, the first time I went, I, I was 30 years old. I had just, I turned 30 when I was in LA, actually. And uh, that first time I went, I went out with absolutely zero expectations. Um, the manager that I had, he represented Emma Roberts. And Emma Roberts was in this film with Noel Clark. And it was a classic. He came up to me on set one day. And it's the sort of the actor's fantasy. He came up to me on set and he said, do you have representation in the States? And I said, no. And he said, would you be interested in it? And I was like, yeah, absolutely. And he said, I think there's something about you. I think you could do really well out there. And I was like, yes, finally. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I went out and again, I had this, and this is probably, it's probably happened to a lot of actors out there as well. Um, the very first meeting I had went really really well uh and the casting director called up my manager and said listen this guy's uh this guy's american accent is flawless he's absolutely perfect for la he a hundred percent he's going to book a job when he's here you know he's really got something special da, 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 da. so he called me up really excited and relayed all this back to me and he was like yeah we're going to get you we're seeing you with one of the really big agents you know, we're definitely going to get you like a million dollar contract when you're out here for one of the TV shows. Uh, and as much as at 30 years old, I was old enough to not, and I'm, I'm quite, I think, I don't know if you put as a Scottish person, I'm naturally quite cynical anyway. So <laughs> it, it's not like I hoovered it all up, but by the same token, also I was like, oh, wow, fuck. Yeah. Uh, you know, really, that, the, the fantasy that I had about myself at 18, <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's seen it. And then nothing actually, you know, I, I came close to some stuff. I had loads of other great meetings. Nothing yeah. actually came to fruition. Uh, and then I came back to London. Um, and then I went back and forward two or three more times. And actually, I had a visa. Okay. And I, 
I was going to move out there. I thought, right, you know what? Going out for one month, never. I thought I'm never quite committing to it. So I thought I'll go out for a year. And then just as I was about to go out, um, I met my who my my now wife. Yeah. And uh, and so I decided, you know what? I don't want to, you know, that, that you know, that's more of a, uh, I put, I think I was 34 at that point, and I'd been putting everything obsessively into getting an acting career for 14 or 13 years. Uh, and, uh, you know, um, the, uh, the idea of actually uh, building a relationship with somebody felt a bit more uh, important yeah. uh, at that point. And, you know, it was the right decision. Uh, and then a couple of months later, I got Outlander, which was an American TV series filming in Scotland. <laughs> it's so, everything happens for a reason, man. Everything happens so yeah, for a reason. Um, I mean, I would still love to work out there one day, and I love LA. Yeah. I know some people can be a bit, um, some, people, some people are a bit down on it. I, I don't know. I never really thought I could live out there full time. I did love it, but I always loved coming home, yeah. you know. It's, it's, it's like I say, it's, it's a fantastic, I think, well, for me, it's a fantastic place to visit and spend a bit of time there, but to live there is such a, I don't know if I could. I don't know. Have you ever read Less Than Zero by Brett Easton Ellis? No, I haven't. You know, um, American I know. Yeah, 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 yeah. So Less Than Zero was his first book. Okay. And Robert Downey Jr. did the movie of it. And it's basically about LA, LA rich kids, mm. like Beverly Hills and stuff driving unbelievably fast cars, living in huge houses, and it's completely vacuous, kind of drug-fueled and empty. And da -da -da -da. The first time I went to LA, I got invited to a party up in Mulholland Drive um, by someone who I didn't really know who she was, but I didn't know anyone else. So I, I drove up to this party in Mulholland mm. Drive in my rented Volkswagen, Yeah, I pulled up outside the house, which I don't know, it was maybe like $10 million house or something. Every car outside was like a Porsche, a Ferrari, uh, like a brand new Range Rover, Lamborghini, et cetera, et cetera. I went into the house. Uh, there was an infinity pool out the back overlooking the Hollywood Hills. That was one of those surreal moments. Yeah, That yeah. was like, fuck, I'm actually in a movie right yeah. now. <laughs> Spoke to the girl who had invited me to the party. She was absolutely off her head and I don't think knew who I was. Then started speaking to some other people and I was like, oh, are you here because of, I can't remember her name, but such and such. Okay. No one knew why they were there either. No one seemed to know each other. And then people just started giving me their cards and saying, hey, give me a shout when you're in LA uh, and, you know, and we can do something. And that, is, that was exactly like that book. Right, okay, you know? okay. And I was like, wow, this is... That this yeah. is actually what it's like out here. So maybe I'll 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 hunt that film down in the book. It's and great. Then, it's really yeah. good. It's really good. Yeah. Oh, no, that's a good story, man. That's a good story to end on, anyway. So, but thank you for your time. I know we could talk for hours, but it's been um it's been lovely talking to you, man. Honestly. You too. Yeah. Cheers, Carl. Thank you, mate. Um, and I'll also get to see you put some person at some point in the future, anyway. So, but but thank you, and I'll um yeah, I appreciate it. But all no, the best. Thank all you very much. They're finishing season three. Hopefully, you can get be finished soon, as you know. So. Well, you know, if it's going the way it's going, we may get finished by about 2022. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, boss. Nice one. Okay, see you. Thanks, man. Enjoy Christmas. Yeah, nice one. Cheers, man. Yeah, you Thank Bye -bye. you. Thanks, man.